Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I just want to make a very short intervention. First to say that I am in support of the amendment. And it has been touted many times around here, but um, I, I have not in my lifetime, and maybe because it's a sh it has been a short space of time, and maybe those who, are, who have spent more time on, on the earth probably, on, probably have a different experience. But it has not been my experience that almost anything that you do that you actually get it right in just one go from the simplest things from learning to tie your shoelace i don't think any of us got it right the first time but but what the opposition has failed to recognize in that situation that they constantly say they don't know what they're doing so they constantly come here and change this and change that and make amendments the one thing that they fail to recognize in that situation is that this government is a government who listens to the people not That's a right. government who says let them pray that's or right. not a prime minister in the person of Philip Joseph Pierre who says, I don't care if people's opinion or they can say it as they please, I will not budge. That is not the case. And I think that is noteworthy. One thing, Mr. Deputy President, that I seem to have recognized is the echo around the house um, today is that there seems to me to be an aversion. There seems to me to be an aversion to the provision of proper health care to every single person in this country right. mr deputy president and i reflect a bit and when i remember when the health and, and security levy when we just started talking about it and when it was first introduced to the house i spoke to a very close relative of mine and we seem to be using a lot of anecdotal um experiences here so i shall follow the train mm -hmm. i spoke with a cousin a very close cousin of mine who resides in the united states and I remember him saying to me, and I don't remember the figures specifically here, but he indicated to me how much he pays on a monthly basis from his salary as his contribution to healthcare in the United States, both he and his partner. But he went on further, Mr. Deputy President, to say to me that he cannot claim medical, he cannot claim medical because of the scale of his salary. And so to me, the situation that he presented to me is a situation where somebody has to pay for somebody. And to me, it, it, that, that is the bottom line of it. We have to find the mechanisms in order for us to raise revenue for the things that are much needed. And so here is why I'm saying that I feel that there is an aversion from the other side when it comes to the provision of health care. Because it seems that every avenue that the government has presented in order to get to the goal of ensuring that healthcare is available and accessible to every person in this country, they're opposing it. Why are they doing that? The reality is there are some of us, and I do not remove myself from the category, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, because I do not believe that I have been elevated to a position where I can afford all of it. So I fall in the category of those, and I can relate to those who cannot. But there has to be mechanism and measures put in place to ensure that, that, that we're able to provide proper health care. Mr. Deputy President, you know, as I sit across here, I've heard a few things touted that has really provoked some emotions. And I do not even want to speak of what the emotions are, Mr. Deputy President. First of all, I need to comment on the fact that when the issue of an, an idea instead of what we consider to be, a, a, well, what is an, an introduction of a new tax, and it can be simplified, and we understand that, that it, it may be onerous in its measure of implementation and calculation and understanding, and, and I, seem, I, I tend to agree that, that it is, but I remember the same thing when VAT was introduced. I remember even me having to deal with VAT at my workplace. And it was difficult for us at first. It was difficult for us, but eventually we got, we got into it and we do it with the snap of our finger. Even I remember maybe two years ago when I had a total, a total crash of my point of sale system, we had to actually calculate VAT manually. But by that time, because we had gotten a, a, a hang of it, we were able to do it even manually without an automated system. 
But when you see the members opposite now ready to jump on the table to a suggestion to let's increase the rate of VAT back to where it was rather than the 2.5. And don't get me wrong, I agree. I, I felt at the time when it was removed, and I remember on the campaign trail in 2021, the elections of 2021, when that idea was brought about by the then um, leader of the opposition who, who became the prime minister, that one of the five point plans was the reduction and eventual elimination of VAT. As somebody who understands um, government income and collection of, 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 of an income from a, from a government standpoint. I, I wondered about it. I wondered, but when you reduce it, because in my mind, I remember all the arguments of 15% was high and so on. And I remember saying, I will not comment on it until I, I, I actually see the fruits. So let charge me 15% or 20% at the supermarket. But it means when I go to the, to the, to the hospital, that's where I want to see the reduction. I want to see that I don't have to pay exorbitant fees for healthcare if I'm already paying 20% VAT. I want to know that my children can go to school and it costs me less to send them to school because I have spread the cost of VAT over the $20 grocery at the supermarket on Monday, the $50 on Wednesday, the $200 at the end of the month. I've paid it a little at a time, whether it's at 20% or 15%, but at the end of the day, I will see the benefits of it with regards to education, with regards to healthcare, and so many other services. And that is really the reason why government is supposed to uh, is supposed to um, 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 collect collect um, revenue and so on. But the senator opposite sat in a government with a prominent position in the government, uh, a position of influence. And I did not hear her cry and, and realize that we were reducing income, government income, when we reduced it from 12.5, from 15 to 12.5. But here is the addition, Mr. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President, can I stand on a point of order? Senator Crying. Charles, what's your point of order? Um, the Honorable Member is misleading the House when she says that we were reducing government income. I'm sure if the Honorable Member takes some time to review all the um, social and economic review, you would realize that it has been established that once the VAT was reduced, that government income, because of consumption, there was not a, re a reduction, but government income remained steady and in most cases increased. So that is misleading the House. Okay, th thank you, Senator Daniel. Continue, please, Senator Shallery. Mr. Deputy President, my other point was going to be that because of the reduction, the Prime Minister then, the Prime Minister then announced that because of the reduction, that there were other measures that had to be implemented. And if the Senator opposite remembers clearly, I remember having that conversation with her then in another life, as to but when it's reduced, what are we going to do? And I remember her saying that they were going to they were going to introduce other avenues because they were going to put other revenue streams. That, that's, a, that's the answer. I'm pretty sure she remembers very, very clearly. So what happened? A dollar and 50 cents excise tax was imposed on fuel to make up for the shortfall. A $35 US tax was imposed on airline tickets in May 2021 to make up for the shortfall. The airport development tax was reintroduced to make up for the shortfall. Have we forgotten? Hmm. Have we forgotten? When we sit on the other side and we say, well, they tell us they're moving 12.5% and I will do the gestures. Eh? They tell us they're removing 12.5% on building material, but they add 2.5% and it's going to be <laughs> Parallels. Have we forgotten? Mr. Deputy President, I am all for being objective and I am all for expressing your opinion if you feel strongly that it is wrong, it's okay. We have freedom of speech, we are here to represent the people, we are here to ensure that our policies and our programs benefit the people and so we can raise objections.
But the idea of pretending and the idea of misleading people into believing that you're now standing up for the rights of the people who cannot speak, when, when you are given the best opportunity to do that, you allow the people of this country to be squeezed morally, and this is the same individual who said on another matter that the then opposition had lost their moral authority to speak on things. But I will not say that. We all have a right to speak up about the things, Madam, Pre Madam Mr. Deputy President. But to apologize too. And so, Mr. Deputy President, like I indicated, I support the, um, the, the change, the amendment. And I, I, I will support this government any time it comes in here, recognizing that we can make it better. We can make it, we, we can improve it. And like I, like I start, said when I started, there are many, many things in, in, in our everyday existence that we start it one way. You start with a particular car, and a few years later you realize, you know what, I'm in a position where I can get a different car, better car. You start with a house color, you paint a wall, and the next few years you realize, let me change the, the paint color. So these things are very fluid. And so when, they, when we recognize that you have perhaps heard or you have perhaps done it wrong, I think it's the, the grown-up thing to, to take recognition and ownership for That's that right. and come back to the people That's and say, look here, we, we, we did it like that. Mm -hmm. In its implementation, we've recognized that there are fundamental issues about it. Mm -hmm. And we are bold enough as a government to come back to the people who elected us That's right. to make the necessary changes. That has to be applauded. And Mr. Deputy President, my, the, the question is why? Why a health and safety levy? Why the need to raise revenue for issues of health, for example? And we've seen, we've seen the implementation, whereas we've been told, oh, we don't know what they were going to do with the money. But the government of the day has never stopped in its quest to improve health care in this country. It has been two years of continuous improvement to our health care, our health care sector, Madam, Mr. Deputy President. We've seen the improvement to the wellness centers, where some of them have now been, been determined as centers of excellence. We've seen UHC being implemented in a very tangible manner, Mr. Deputy President. Not like the health insurance that the white paper could not be found, Mr. Deputy President. We've seen tangible things. The very tangible things that they've continued to criticize. 80 plus program, how many people are 80 years? My great grandmother is 100 and, 100 and what, give you 103? 103. And the, the leader of government businesses, his grandmother is closely, you know, fighting to meet up with my great grandmother. We have good genes, Mr. Deputy President. So we know, we know that these people can benefit from these things. And then we say UHC, we look at maternal and child health care, and oh, they're up in arms about it. But it's tangible, it's tangible. It's not a pie in the sky idea, like the health insurance that we heard about over and over again for more than five years, but we cannot speak to it. And then we hear that the documents are somewhere, so somebody should produce it, but somebody have it on their personal laptop or their personal thumb drive and they can produce it to government. Okay? So I implore us to let's be real about the reality of what exists in terms of healthcare and security with the understanding, very, very simple understanding, that we are where we are, we are in the position that we are at now, and we need to find ways to ensure that we can provide these services for the people who cannot otherwise provide it for themselves, Mr. Deputy President. I think there is a lot more that can be done, and there is a lot of way that we need to go still, but we have to start some way to provide these services to our people, Mr. Deputy President. And I understand, and I heard the Minister of Commerce in the lower house speak specifically to the reduction of the VAT on the sanitary napkins and so on. And um, to my recollection, she indicated that when they did their assessments, they recognized that it was not being implemented properly. And that is the reality of a fundamental weakness of introducing new taxation. 
and I, I, I did expect the same to be for this one. But it's the, the onus is on the Ministry of Commerce to ensure that they continue to make their rounds, that they continue to be vigilant on the ground to ensure that the businesses who, who are eligible to, to, um, to pay this tax and to remit this tax, that it is done in a manner that is, that is fair and legal, Mr. Deputy President. So that's we, the people of this country, especially the ones who cannot afford health care from our own pockets and our own earnings, will benefit from these programs and strategies of the government of St. Lucia. That is my short intervention and reiterate my support, Mr. Deputy President. Thank you. Thank you.